Okay, we're good to go. All right. Welcome to the second of our shop talk series on the impact of COVID on the black community. My name is Donnie Miller. I'm the CEO of the Neighborhood Health Association and the host of the Bridges Talk Show on 13 ABC. Tonight, we are talking about the economic impact of COVID on our community. You know, it was just 12 short weeks ago that the US economic picture was very bright with unemployment at a 50 year low. Wage growth was strong. There was record optimism among small businesses until COVID-19. When that virus hit this country, our world changed. In 2016, the Pew um, Foundation found that, and listen to this, the median wealth for African-Americans was 10 times lower than their white counterparts, roughly $17,100. Listen to this, 8% of black and Hispanic workers earn below the poverty level compared with just 4% of white workers. Even more alarming is that 10% of all black women and 9% of Hispanic women are classified as working poor. There's a very real risk of families losing their income and their businesses of all sizes, suffering um, a negative impact, everyone suffering a negative impact and a slowing of the uh, economic market because of COVID-19. The good news about all of that is we have an amazing panel to talk with you uh, about that this evening. And it is my honor and my distinct pleasure to have with us the director of the Department of Jobs and Family Services, Kimberly Hall. Let me tell you just a bit about Ms. Hall. If I were to read all of her accomplishments, honestly, we would be here this time tomorrow night. So I just wanna tell you just a little bit about this amazing woman. Kimberly Hall previously served as Senior Vice President of the Administration and General Counsel at Columbus State University College, Community College. Ms. Hall joined Columbus State in 2012, and she provides executive guidance on college policy, administration, and strategic initiatives. Her leadership portfolio includes this included at that time the supervision of the Legal Office, Human Resources Department, Equity and Compliance Office, Police Department, Facilities Management Division, and the Shared Government Office. She also served um, as liaison to the Board of Trustees for the Department and Implementation of Board Policy. She has served as the Deputy Chief Counsel for Attorney uh, General Mike DeWine. She is the founder and president of the Olive Tree Foundation for Girls. I wish you had time to talk to us about that today. It's a nonprofit organization that provides mentoring, enrichment programs, and scholarships for young women. She currently serves as director of the Department of Jobs and Family Services. We also have with us this evening, Aisha Silliman. Um, Ms. Sleeman is the staff attorney for the Joseph R. Tafelski Fellow and Advocates for the, basic, uh, the Office of Basic Legal Equality. She represents the community and neighborhood uh, to ensure that equitable access to community development is allowed, is provided. And she advocates for the development of opportunities for low-income individuals and communities. She is passionate about empowering clients to create a new economy that is responsive to all with a focus on housing and access to capital. Shalonda Jones is also with us today. Ms. Jones is the program assistant at LISC Toledo. She currently supports the Toledo Financial Network, assists with uh, their 16-year um, initiative, and helps with other LISC programs. Through a collaboration with LISC and United Way, Shalonda also runs the VITA program for Lucas County. This program provides free tax preparation services for income eligible Lucas County residents. Kathy Tucker is with us tonight as well. Kathy brings over 10 years of retail mortgage and business banking experience to her current position as executive director of the Northwest Ohio Housing Development Agency, otherwise known as NOTA. Reporting to the board of directors, she has overall strategic and operational responsibility for NOTA's nonprofit staff, programs, expansion, and execution of its mission. The agency provides a variety of HUD programming, 
Counseling and Home Buyer Education Services to Lucas and surrounding counties. And finally, we have with us Tanya Saunders. Ms. Saunders serves, Ms. Saunders serves as the director of the Lucas County Department of Planning and Development. In that capacity, she oversees the integration of workforce and economic development into one agency designed to simultaneously meet the needs of Lucas County job seekers and businesses. By leveraging relationships with local, regional, and statewide development partners, she coordinates a range of services to promote the success of local businesses. So obviously you see that the panel that we have tonight is well prepared to discuss this topic with you. We are going to start with opening statements from Director Hall. Please um, put your comments online and we will, your questions as well. And we will, um, we will make sure that the director has the opportunity to answer those questions before she leaves. Unfortunately, she's going to be with us for just the first part of our time together tonight. So listen closely, Director. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate the opportunity to join everyone live on Facebook. Uh, all of the technology enhancements that we're focusing on as a part of responding to COVID-19 has really enabled me to brush up my skill set. So hopefully in this space, so hopefully I do okay. But uh, Donnie, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be a part of this esteemed panel. As we get uh, right to it, first and foremost, I know uh, that our unemployment situation in Ohio is very much top of mind with all of, all of the members of our community across the state and certainly those of the black community. So right now we have uh, our most recent unemployment filings that have, have come through week ending April 18, another 109,369 jobless claims were filed week ending April 18, which brings our total to nearly 1 million individuals who have filed claims for unemployment benefits since the time that we uh, first began responding with our distancing efforts and business closures in mid-March. We have paid out over $926 million in unemployment compensation to over 376,000 Ohioans. I do know and I'm acutely aware of the fact that we still have eligible Ohioans who are waiting to receive their benefits. The system has been uh, tremendously overwhelmed by the number of claims, frankly, which in the past month or the past five weeks or so has uh, exceeded what we received in an entire two year period. So we are dealing with a tremendous volume. We've added staff working longer hours. We have private sector partners, uh, Amazon, Deloitte, et cetera, that are helping us with our technology. As it pertains to the African-American community, we already know that minorities are, are whenever there's an economic downturn or an event, a public health challenge of this nature, we know that our minority populations are disproportionately impacted typically. And we're seeing that bear out with our uh, COVID-19 on, on the public health side. On the unemployment side, I'll share a few statistics in terms of how claims are breaking down right now. And this, these are stats from um, the March time period. Uh, we're still in a position of running with April. So in March 2020, total of 591,000 claims. And of those, um, we have 11.5% were from African American claimants, 79% from uh, white claimants, 5% Hispanic, and then between Asian and Pacific Islander or American Indian, another one half percent. That data, as I said, is from March and we'll, we will continue to be able to break that down. Uh, even on the workforce side, on the workforce development side within ODJFS, we know from our experience in, in partnering with our counties all across the state, and we have uh, Tanya Saunders here, who's a, a wonderful partner with the Lucas County 
um, uh, team up there. We know that our African American community is is acutely in need of additional resources, even in times of very low unemployment. We knew that we needed to apply extra resources and extra support, and that need continues even further now. ODJFS is a part certainly of the economic response right now, immediate response, providing unemployment benefits, SNAP benefits, workforce development resources, cash assistance, et cetera. But we also will be key to economic recovery, especially for our African-American community. So you have my commitment to continuing to focus on this. I won't rest until everyone who's eligible receives their benefits. And I, I welcome the opportunity to respond to questions at this point in time. Thank you, Director, very much. One of the um, questions that we hear an awful lot is that the system seems to be moving fairly slowly in response to inquiries um, about, about unemployment claims. Do you see that getting better anytime soon? Thank you, I, actually I do. So we've had a really uh, big week within ODJFS in terms of rolling out a number of system improvements that the public will really be able to begin experiencing in, in a more uh, apparent way. So our virtual call center is preparing to go online and you'll begin to experience a better phone experience. Our call volume with our phones, we were hitting at, uh, at one point on one day, we received a million calls. We oh just, my goodness. We don't have the, the staff certainly to handle that. And so Amazon Web Services is now going to be providing our call center program infrastructure. Everybody knows that Amazon is you know, at the top of the game right now on, in the online space. And so we are really excited that individuals will be able to get into the phone system. We're scaling up agents. We had before COVID hit 42 agents on the phones. Now we're at 1600 and we'll continue to, uh, to move forward with that. Um, our website has been redesigned to make it more intuitive, more easy to file. Um, it, it really is a factor of just the tremendous volume and scaling up. It's a 16 year old system. Absolutely. Could you tell us what the current status is of our claims for those folks who are 1099 employees or self-employed? Yes, yeah, so what you're referring to is a new federal program that Congress enacted that essentially provides additional supports for those who aren't eligible for regular unemployment. So the 1099 employees, we are opening up a portal uh, that will be open later in the day tomorrow so that individuals in that category can apply for PUA benefits. That's what we're, the program is called, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. And so they will be able to self-register, understand what uh, pre-register, understand what kind of documentation they need, get their login credentials and all of that starting later in the day tomorrow. So that process, they'll receive a base unemployment payment plus $600 every week. Thank you so much for that information. You know, one of the other questions that we hear um, an awful lot is that part of the confusion when you're applying for unemployment comes with whether you can claim those weeks prior to your actually getting through to submit your claim. Is it, is it possible to claim those weeks or are those weeks lost? Yeah, so the benefit opportunity is retroactive to the date that an individual was first, that an, an individual first became unemployed as a result of the COVID pandemic response. So mm -hmm. for some, it was that March 15th day when restaurants and bars were closed. For others, it was later as we moved into the stay at home order space, et cetera. So uh, no matter when the claim is filed, the payments will be retroactive. Okay, thank you for that. There, is it possible, um, Director, to give us an update on the status of the additional $600 
payment that I, I many, many people are looking forward to that. Um, people have gotten the, uh, the um, $1,200 payments, many of them have, but the $600 payments seem to be a little slower arriving. Mm -hmm. So the $600 payments actually were released on yesterday and people have started seeing them today. Oh, great. Great, great. You to unfold depending on banks and, and their, their timing, but individuals will start seeing that into their accounts as early as today, into tomorrow through the weekend, and definitely by the beginning of the weeks. That total that we have sent out the door um, as of yesterday was an additional $530 million in wow. what are called PUC payments. So everyone who is receiving regular unemployment, we sent out, a, that was about $396 million this week. Mm -hmm. And yesterday we added another $530 million on top of that for a total of $926 million out the door as of yesterday. So people should be patient. Their money is coming. Um, it's just a very complicated system right now. It's an overwhelmed system right now, but those that money is coming out. That's correct. And I know patience is not what anybody has right now who's facing the situation. And like I said, uh, we are working night and day on this. And I, I'm deeply sorry for anyone who is still waiting on those benefits. We're, we are exercising um, waivers to requirements and working really hard to move those payments through, but they are out the door, they are on the way, and we have system improvements that are on the way as well. One final question. What advice would you give someone who was trying to, to make this work um, other than being patient? Is there information that they should have when they make the call? What can they do to make this process easier for them, for themselves? There are a number of things. First, certainly utilizing online resources. We have a virtual chat assistant. A lot of people are getting familiar with the little chat button that comes up on various websites. We have a virtual chat bot that is helpful. Filing the claim online is helpful. Using the mass layoff number is helpful, which is 2,180, making sure that that's a part of the claim. Um, uh, uh, allowing the, the spinning wheel when the computer is thinking, allowing it to think and keep moving forward versus trying to back out yeah. or what have you. Um, those are those are the kinds of things that will really help move things along. Thank you so much. It has been such a pleasure talking with you this evening, and I really hope that you will visit us again. We'll um, do. And thank you so much. Thank you for we'll this. be talking to you soon. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. All right. We are going to move right ahead now. Um, Aisha, Shalanda, Kathy, Tanya, you've got lots and lots to share with these folks today about this most important topic. Um, Tanya, what, what are you finding to be the major barriers of um, folks in this economy in Toledo? Um, most of the barriers are, you know, we have transportation issues. Um, when you're looking at uh, shift jobs, we have daycare issues. Um, and then we also have a, a real problem in terms of the, the pre-employment um, checkers with uh, background checks and drug screening. Um, have so these gotten worse, Tanya? Have these gotten worse since COVID has, has hit? We haven't really seen much of that just yet, um, but they've been very constant, um, obviously with the different changes uh, with legislation, but that's really our biggest message here and what we're trying to communicate to job seekers that even in this idle period, um, you know, this is an opportunity to try to address a lot of those things. Um, that's why we, you know, kept our services available by phone and virtually, so we can still be that connector to the services to help them to navigate through um, those barriers, because this is the time to really try to address those issues and pay special attention to those matters. Yeah, thank you very much. I know that people tend, um, we, we tend to absorb the information from around the United States in terms of how COVID is affecting other communities. But in fact, it's having quite a significant impact 
on this community as well. Aisha, your impressions of how this disease is uh, affecting the economy of Toledo. Sorry, um, I was muted. Um, I mean, that's a really big answer that I think we could spend hours talking about. I think what I am immediately most concerned about, you know, is a lot of people who will not be able to afford their rent, their bills. Um, and I can talk about, you know, some of the eviction protections that are out there, but I'm also really, and I, I work with neighborhood organizations and community-based organizations, and it's a pretty big concern for them to access all of the, ki the kinds of relief that are out there. I think, you know, my frustration with a lot of the relief that is out there is that it doesn't, it's not centering equity and race equity. So, you know, I, we've talked about this. I've talked about this with other people, the small business funds, you can't have a felony in the last five years to access that, that funding. Or um, you, you need to have a pretty good relationship with a bank to access that funding. And the loss of a small business or you know, a community organization in particular neighborhoods in Toledo is gonna have a significantly worse impact than if you lose a business out in the suburbs. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's, those are the two things. I think people being able to pay their bills and but also the larger neighborhood effect. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, and the, the issue with the felony is an interesting one because it's not, it's just the requirement that they not have a felony. It doesn't matter if it's a violent felony yep. or nonviolent felony. Mm -hmm. And that makes the business totally, that makes them totally ineligible. And a lot of people when they're incarcerated, they, you know, they leave and they have trouble getting a job because like Tony's right. background. So they start their own business and now they're still cut, cut off from this assistance. That's right. Uh, yeah, so, but I mean, I'm, I think we were also going to talk about housing, so I don't want to take away the conversation from that, too. <laughs> well, that's the, the, the inequity in the system, though, is really important because we need to, um, we need to let folks know that this is yet another place where their voices are important, and they need to raise their voices to make sure that there is access to this, to, to the remedies by the, the communities that, that are being hit the hardest. So I really appreciate your saying that. And um, Kathy, I know that, that you're running into some of the same inequities in your market as well. Yes, so um, at NOTA, what we specialize in is helping people navigate and get prepared for the home buying process. And interestingly enough, when this happened, you have to think of some of the factors that are, are acutely critical to getting people to buy a home. One is uh, consistent employment. Right. So we've got hundreds of thousands of people who are laid off and a lot of our program participants. But also what has come up is I expected that with all of the changes that we might see a little bit of relief and a little bit of room with uh, underwriting guidelines for those mm -hmm. pursuing a mortgage. And unfortunately, especially with the clients that we serve and, and communities of color and, and underrepresented um, families, that those guidelines have actually um, Got, gotten more strict. So for example, when it would be a minimum credit score through some of the community lending programs and through like FHA, VA, maybe the minimum credit score was a 580 or a 600, you know, it moves up to a 640 or a 660 or a 700. So we have a handful of clients that were pre-approved and who are getting ready to go under contract because they found a home but then when the loan application is actually um, needing to be taken, they no longer qualify. So it turns from a, I've got my home to now I'm denied for a mortgage. And a lot of these new um, guidelines um, are being imposed for the next 90 days. So that's one of the challenges that our agency is striving towards and trying to you know, continue to support and encourage our clients not to give up now. It's just gonna take a little bit more time or we just have to be working with them more closely. Wow, that's that's amazing. That's really interesting. Is there what do you think the rationale behind that change is? Well, I think that the banks are taking on a tremendous amount of risk right now. Okay, so you've got banks that are low to moderate risk, and um, now I think they're trying. They're getting these business loans, and they're trying to maybe absorb um, some of the risk. But it's unfortunate that those 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 changes most adversely affect the client population that we serve. And again, there is a variety of impediments 
that occur for people of color and people, you know, um, in the African American community to get to get through the home buying process. So this just added an entire new um, layer. And I don't know that with an FHA, a VA, some of those government backed products um, that we have control over that. I do want to say though, that I have talked to a variety of our financial um, partners at the banks and their conventional products, which are the products that they actually um, house and, and manage have not had too many changes. So mm -hmm. a lot of people need to go FHA or prefer to, but it's working with the banks and that's what we're here to help to kind of help liaison that process and maybe switch between products for the banks that are trying to cover that on the back end by sustaining their conventional products. And so if someone's having an issue um, when in their banking relationship at this time, they could call you. Yeah, we would love to assist and help and leverage our, our relationships to continue their home buying process. That's great. And we're going to have Kathy's information for you at the end of our um, at the end of our time together today. Here's a question from a viewer though that I'd like to throw out to the panel. And the viewer is asking this: Is a person still eligible to, to remain or even file for unemployment? if the job reopens, but they are recovering from COVID or are they considered an at-risk individual? Tanya? Um, the answer to that question, I mean, at this point, anyone can pretty much apply um, in terms of what the eligibility is. The eligibility is not based on whether or not um, you have the uh, COVID-19. It's if you're a displaced worker and you've been laid off due to the COVID-19. So if the employer that you were working for um, laid you off or you were not able um, to work, uh, you would still want to go ahead and apply for benefits. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And would your, Tanya, before you, before you go away, would your recommendation to people who are listening today be that if they have any questions at all about their unemployment that they file? Yes. That they file I, anyway. Yes. Um, and the other thing that I would say too, the FAQs um, on the unemployment, which I know we'll be displaying um, probably at the end of this uh, here is gonna answer a lot of those questions. I mean, that thing is growing like by the hour and that is mm -hmm. the most relevant, up-to-date, same time information that you can receive because changes are happening very rapidly uh, for the FAQs all about unemployment. Yeah, yeah. good, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I think that people sometimes feel as though there are no options for handling their finances in this particular time. Um, and, and certainly you have some um, ideas about that should ha how that should happen, Tanya. And so does, um, so does Shalanda. So does Shalanda. So why don't we, Shalanda, would you give us some um, information on the, um, the Financial Opportunity Center Network? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. um, thank you. Well, in Toledo, we have the, a network of financial opportunity centers. They're operated by GLISC and some local partners. Those partners are Pathway, ProMedica, Lutheran Social Services, and NeighborWorks. Now, these services are free to any individual um, that needs assistance. Right now, we're seeing a lot of people coming in needing assistance with unemployment, accessing those benefits, um, navigating their budgets due to their income changes. Either their jobs have been reduced or just eliminated, so they're not working right now. Um, again, we do help them apply for unemployment, but in the meantime, helping them access other benefits like food resources, um, utility assistance, so that they can maintain their lights and gas bills. Um, and most of this is, a lot of our clients are from the African-American community. Um, and again, the services there are free. So we're just trying to navigate this crisis and helping as many people as possible from whatever avenue they're coming from. Okay, how do they, um, do they need an, appo an appointment for the FOC? Yes, right now you will need an appointment. Do. At the end of this, um, there will be a slide that'll have contact information for all four locations and they can call and schedule something to meet with the financial coach. And the great thing about it is that um, with the FOCs, there's sort of a personal aspect to it. This isn't one of those centers where you're gonna come in and be processed like a number. 
you'll always meet with that same person. So you'll have a relationship where they know you. Um, that way, every time you come in, you're not reliving your whole history. You're dealing with someone that knows you and your particular situation. So they're better able to help you. Are, are the services free? Yes, they're free for anyone that wants to take advantage of it. Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good point about, about the wanting to take advantage of it. People are often um, a little embarrassed by trying to access these kinds of services. What would you say to them? I would say that you paid into these systems. Right now, you need them. Um, don't be embarrassed. Right now, we're all going through something. We have people from all walks of life that would never thought they would never need any sort of assistance, but it's there. There is no shame in taking it. Um, why suffer through a crisis or struggle if you can get some assistance to help you get over this hurdle? That's exactly right. And information, of course, everyone who's listening is absolutely confidential. You don't have to worry about your information being shared um, outside of the office. Is that right, Shalanda? That's correct. We've helped people in all aspects of life. We've said in meetings um, with people that we helped and we don't mention that we saw you or you came to the office. Um, your personal business is your personal business. We're just here to help you. Thank you so very much. Here's another question from our audience. Can individuals apply for PRC online? Yes, you can start the application online. You can also take that application down to JFS. Right now they are accepting applications by email and fax as well. Thank you so very much. So Aisha, Tell me, what do people do? What can people do who find that they are just overwhelmed with some of the inequities in the system? Oh, I mean, that's a that's a that's also a really big question. You're hitting me with the, <laughs> the hard ones. I mean, look, you know, even I think for me is we need to start, you know, building a movement. I think that this is a moment that is really unique because in crisis, I think we can either go you know, create really bad policies or we can create really good ones. I always think of the fact that the Fair Housing Act was passed in the aftermath of the assassination of Martin Luther King. And the Fair Housing Act has, you know, it has its weaknesses, but it, it came out of a moment of deep crisis. And I think that this is a time where we can all work together to push for actual assistance programs that can work. I think the one that's on my mind lately, and I think a lot of people at the firm is, you know, a rental assistance eviction type moratorium how can we absolutely create yeah. a, a policy because you know come may 1st hearings will probably get scheduled and people That's right. who have not paid rent will mm -hmm. probably are facing eviction and the only option you have in ohio is to work with your landlord if your landlord doesn't want to work with you they don't have to accept back rent i think we really need some you know as build that critical mass of people to advocate for policies both at the, the state and local level, right? So I think of the example of um, in Los Angeles, they created a, a, a rental assistance program, but also created a moratorium on evictions that went beyond not scheduling hearings. It, it yeah. actually created a 90 day period after the emergency ends for people to pay back you know, their rent. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that needs a lot of creativity across a lot of different um, organizations and power players. And I think we all need to use that, our voices right now in this moment that can provide for real reform. I totally agree with you. I, I think that um, even though there's a lot on everybody's plate right now, you, you don't want to think about one more thing that you have to fight for. This is really the time to recognize that if we don't advocate for policy changes now, it will only get worse. This is not going to get better for you. Right. Um, that's why it's so important that you pay attention to what Shalanda said about the FOCs and what Kathy has said about NODA and what Tanya is saying. These are resources out there because trust me, even if you delay your rent, the landlord is going to come back at some point and ask for the entirety of that rent. I see you nodding your head, Aisha. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest advice that you, you have to, you have to pay your rent right now. Um, right. The state unfortunately did not act on evictions and assistance for tenants. So if you, you, you have, you have to pay your rent. Um, hopefully your landlord will work with you, but 
come May 1st. And I do want to be clear right now, you know, you can be evicted, but there will be no hearings scheduled and no move outs. So until May 1st, you're safe somewhat. But yeah, after May 1st, your landlord can come back and, and ask Okay, you so that. let's let's say that again, because I think that's really worth worth repeating. You can be evicted, but nothing will happen until after May 1st. Right, because when, you know, a, you can have an eviction filed against you, but you there no hearing will be scheduled until May 1st. That's right. So you're safe until then in some sense. But, you know, again, eviction hearings move really quickly. Any uh, attorney can tell you that. So it, it's a pretty quick process once that hearing is scheduled. So that's right. And May 1st is what, two weeks away yeah, right less now. Than two weeks Away. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so Aisha, would you would you suggest though that if they're if someone is having trouble with their rent, that they have an, a a conversation with their landlord first, right now? I I would yeah I would try to have a conversation with a landlord. I don't know how responsive some I think will work with you. I don't know about others. I would definitely give Abel a call. You know, I, we have our information. If you if you really you don't think you can make it and we'll probably, you know, are dealing with eviction. So um, I think we'll provide that info in the slide. Um, I would try to work with the landlord. That's really the only thing um, I can do. Yeah, thank you for that. Here's another question from our audience. Is it true that part-time workers aren't eligible for any benefits? So um, as, as Director Hall mentioned, um, the expanded program, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program does include 1099ers and part-time um, workers. So they do qualify under that Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Okay. So, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you all about this as well. I've seen a lot of ads on TV um, these days that say, will defer your payments for 90 days or you don't have to pay you can buy a car from us and your first payment isn't until you know june or something like that what would you tell people those are very attractive commercials and it sounds like they sound like they're they're actually doing people a favor during this difficult time what do you think about that tanya and shalanda um i would say you know you know, when you think about uh, the different uh, sources of money that's coming to our community, it is so important for financial literacy in terms of understanding what those stimulus dollars really is for. And, you know, making big purchases such as a car that, you know, on the front end, it sounds, you know, really good and it's almost too good to be true, but you got to think long term. Um, and it's going to take some time to, you know, get things back to where we used to be. And so even with the job market, um, you know, as we begin to open business again, the job market is going to become very competitive. I mean, you heard the number of people, 14% of the labor force in Ohio is unemployed as of now. So that is an incredible amount of people that once um, all of the, ben the benefits are exhausted or people no longer qualify for those benefits, everyone is going to be seeking employment. And in that time frame, you may not have, you know, gotten a job as soon as uh, regular times. And so if you've committed to a lot of those, those car ads, you know, you're looking at 60 and 70 and 80 months for a car that you're committing to that you may not be able to commit to uh, from for long term. Okay, Shalanda, yeah. what's your what are your thoughts? Yeah, and I was gonna say that's another reason to work with a financial coach. They're working with you with your budget, looking at what you can afford. Sometimes we are approved for things that we are not not necessarily good for us. So mm -hmm. working with your coach would help you make those financial decisions. This could be a good offer for somebody else, but for somebody else, it's a setup, it's a disaster. Um, you're getting this car, you don't have to make these payments. And right now with the other things that are also being delayed, some mortgages, um, some car insurance companies are working with people not to cancel policies. So you'll have quite a load of bills that will come due at the exact same time. And mm -hmm. if you're not prepared for that, that could really put you in another tailspin. And that's another, just following up on what somebody else said, that you're getting these stimulus checks, use them wisely, um, pay your rent, pay your utilities. There was also a question that you had asked her um, earlier about talking to the landlord. And I would also say, talk to your creditors as well. Um, 
your Great mortgage point. company, your Great car loan point. company. Right now, a lot of your lenders are making special accommodations for you. They will work with you, but they can't unless you call them. So call them to work things out. That way you won't have these negative marks from your credit report for late payments during this time. Thank you so much for that. That's a great point. You know, Kathy, I was thinking while Shalanda was speaking that um, this has got to be a time when we see more, more issues arise when it comes to fair housing, um, that there would be more, um, the more opportunity for discrimination to occur simply because, and I hate to use the word profiling, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. And is, is that something that we should be prepared for? Um, because it is really well known at this point that people of color are suffering more than others. Will they face increased barriers when it comes to things like trying to find um, rental housing or primarily rental housing? Um, I think that, you know, history and its trends for, you know, communities of color during, you know, times like this is, is pretty evident. You know, when Shalanda was talking and Tanya was talking, what came to mind was during this time, um, particularly in communities of color, you know, for decades, um, redlining has occurred. And when we're talking about some of these different opportunities for cars, loans, Unfortunately, our communities of color have really um, been victim of exploitation, okay? Absolutely. So yeah. you can bet your bottom dollar that these are going to be more and more prevalent, especially since this whole COVID-19 is adversely affecting um, and disproportionately affecting communities of color. So unfortunately, um, I, I wish it weren't the case and I don't project and hope it's the case, but you do have to really be aware of your rights and you have to understand when um, discrimination is, is apparent and it's going to be in housing. And a lot of times, um, and I know Aisha will, will nod her head to me um, when I say this, a lot, of these, um, a lot of these fair housing issues are buried in policies and they're implicit and it doesn't feel right, but you can't say why, um, you can't articulate it. If you're not sure you've got resources, be sure to ask because you're going to see it and we've already seen it. What are the kinds of things that people should, should look for, Kathy? You know, it's far more sophisticated than it used to be. You're not gonna get the door slammed in your face most often. Um, and probably people are going to be very nice to you in the actual interview process. So what kinds of things should they look for? What we advise our clients and suggest is that um, to uh, when, and I'll give some examples. So if a question is being asked of you and it doesn't sound right, ask them, push back a little bit and ask them why they're asking you that question. You know, I had a client at one point was going through the mortgage process and they were asking her for information that I had never, in all my experience, I, I've never seen anyone or heard of anyone ask for this information. So instead of because exactly, you can't just be like, I know what you're doing, even though you're covering it up. What you have right. to do is say, why is it that I have to provide this additional information? Why is it over the phone that you're saying that I shouldn't apply for these small business funds? Or why are you saying they ran out, but I know that my colleague received them? Do not right. be afraid to use your voice and ask those questions. If it doesn't sound right, just ask about it. And you have resources um, on the financial side and the legal side on the call today. But if you hear it and it doesn't sound right, just ask. Just ask. Again, again, the thread that goes through this conversation, the conversation we had um, last week, uh, the conversations that you will hear coming all, up all have to do with the power of your voice. Don't just accept things in silence. Raise your voice, use your voice. Here's a question for you, Tanya, specifically. What programs, um, are there available for people to take advantage of while they're sheltering in place? So there are many opportunities. Um, one of the things that's still operational through Ohio Means Jobs, Lucas County is um, online assessments. Um, this is a good time to kind of um, look at your skill assessments. Um, one incredible opportunity that's still available is GED programming. 
Um, Owens Community College is still offering um, GED classes. So for those that have uh, the need to pursue a GED can actually participate in online classes. Um, we can also provide resume help, one-on-one -on -one resume help, whether it be through the phone or a Skype. Mm -hmm. um, we're also doing mock interviewing, um, resume critique, critiquing. Uh, we're also helping people to navigate through applications. Um, pretty much any type of one-on-one -on -one, um, job prep uh, opportunities for individuals. Um, other things that we're serving as is really a resource to connect them to other uh, services, such as the mm -hmm. services mm -hmm. right here on this panel and others uh, for re-entry, for housing and other different services that's available. We partner with our county JFS uh, as well. So we are also navigating people to the, uh, prop, uh, to the pro proper places where they can get the aid that they need. And if I could just also kind of piggyback off what we were talking about with the vehicles. Um, another thing that I see in our community is, you know, as we began to start to open up and people are trying to prepare themselves to be ready for jobs. Um, I really feel like they are put in a, a position where they feel like they have to go after some of the predatory lending to mm -hmm. say, well, I gotta have a car to go back and forth to work. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so incredible about having the Financial Opportunity Center coaches that can really give them those opportunities to say, no, you really don't. Or, you know, going after the, the predatory uh, cash cards because they don't have the ability to open up a regular checking or savings account. Right. Uh, all of those are things that we are really talking with job seekers to say, hey, we really got to, you know, really look at those things and make sure that you have a way that you can have your pay paycheck uh, directly deposit into an account. So we need to work on those things now. We need to figure out a plan as to how you're gonna get back and forth to work. And we also say, you know, don't agree to take on a shift that you know that you can't commit to long-term just to get right. the job. You wanna right. be realistic. Um, so those are some of the other things that we're providing assistance in um, for job seekers. Yeah, in a lot of ways, this is a great time, would you not agree, to take a look at where you are in your life and, and where you'd like your life to be different and to take some steps to make that happen. Absolutely. I mean, there's actually a positive in all of this. Uh, we are all paused pretty much, and this is a good right. opportunity because um, a lot of people in our community are really balancing a lot in, in normal circumstances, and it's really hard to sit down and say, what do I tackle first? Mm -hmm. And this is that opportunity to say, now I can prioritize my life and, and see how do I get to that end part of what I really want to do for my family. Right, right. Thank you for that point. Aisha, there is a question that is um, directly, um, it's directly to you by a viewer. And the question is this, can your landlord still evict you even though you told him that you're out of work and you're still waiting and you're waiting for your stimulus check? It depends on what he said. I mean, if you don't pay your rent, they can evict you. Although I did want to correct in my mess of Preparing for this, I missed that the um, Toledo Municipal Court did extend their um, continuing of eviction hearings until May 30th. So you can have an eviction filed, but you will not be out, you know, you're not having a hearing scheduled until May 30th. So mm -hmm. have until then to sort of get the money, hopefully pay and, you know, um, keep your housing. But technically, if you don't pay rent and you miss paying rent, you can be evicted. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so even the what happens on the at the end of the month though, Aisha, what's the process after the 30th hits? Hopefully hopefully more continuances. Um, but uh but that's well, possible. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. who knows, right? Um, but they can hearings will be scheduled and you will, you know, have to either figure something out, get a settlement agreement with your landlord, that's hopefully when you would call us and we would hopefully be able to assist you. Or, you know, you'd have to, you could be hopefully not evicted, but I mean, you know, hearings will be scheduled and you'll have to go to court. Okay, and, uh, you know. all right. You know, those conversations can be really hard to start. Shlanda, what are you, what does your organization recommend? How do you start those conversations? 
Well, we start by trying to uplift our clients, giving them the confidence to make those calls. We will even assist them with making those calls if they're not comfortable with doing it themselves. But just trying to give them, um, empower them to take some initiative to do it themselves. But, and again, with the eviction thing, another part of what we do is help people access income supports. And one of those income supports is rental assistance. So we try to keep ourselves aware of different resources that the community offers so that we can connect those clients that are in need um, so that they can keep their housing in this crisis. Is, are there rental supports right now? Yes. There yes. are. Mm -hmm. um, to access them, what would the eligibility be generally? It, would, it depends on who's offering the assistance. Mm -hmm. So depending on who's offering it, they have their different qualifications. Um, but one program that does offer it is PRC, JFS. Mm -hmm. They have a rental assistance program as well that we're assisting clients with. And usually that's by income. And another requirement is having a minor child in the household. Okay. Kathy, can you be, can your landlord, um, can they give you a deadline as to when they will start eviction proceedings or do, is there some protection that you have in the, at this particular time to keep them from Im, imposing a deadline? So can they say for you, for instance, I'm going to give you two more weeks? I think that's uh, um, Aisha. Aisha? Can you, can you repeat the question exactly? Absolutely. So can your landlord, and I, and I think we all know the answer, but I do wanna hear you say this. Um, it's, can your landlord tell you how long he is going to give you to pay your rent? So if you're waiting for your stimulus question as the person was before, and they, they know that their stimulus um, amount is going to come, their check is going to come in the next six months, can he say absolutely not? I'm not going to allow you to wait for your stimulus check. Yeah, they they don't have a they don't have a duty to accept the rent if it's if it's late. Oh, okay. There. Sorry, I'm having some tech issues. Yeah, I but I think I heard you say that they're they really are not bound by any particular requirement. They can they can give you um, a deadline if they want to. Okay, I think that we've lost Aisha for just a moment here. Kathy, are you still there? There you are. Kathy, mm -hmm. when, what, um, what protections do you have for your mortgage during this time? Um, a really good question. I do wanna plug in here too that we're talking a lot about you know, landlord, tenant, and as you can see, there are a tremendous amount of rights that you do not have when you're a renter, which is why I, um, in conjunction with my agency, this is why we advocate so much for home ownership because you get some of that control back. So let me give you an example. So a lot of the banks right now um, are giving a, a multitude of different options for payment deferrals. So mm -hmm. you um, may be able to, I've seen some banks that will say, okay, for the next 90 days, you may not have to pay they may work out a payment plan afterwards, or you can actually go through a full loan modification, which means you can submit an application for hardship to your mortgage company and um, they will evaluate it. And then a lot of times what they can do is put that amount that you owe, let's say for three months, four months, mm -hmm. and they can actually put that on the back end of your loan, um, oh, which yeah. gives you some of that relief. So these are mm -hmm. some of the contracts. Do you see where um, rights are a little different when it comes yeah. to home ownership? You can kind of claim that power back a little bit. Um, now, of course, the bank can always move forward with foreclosure, but they've got a tremendous investment involved mm -hmm. um, since you've taken out the mortgage with them. So that's why I... Um, those are some of the options if you're looking for with your mortgage. It just depends on the mortgage company or banks, but they've been pretty, um, I've been pretty satisfied with what I've seen. Okay. And if someone wanted to refinance their mortgage right now, are the, you're smiling. Mm -hmm. Do you like yeah. that option? Of course. So <laughs> um, this is that's a great question. My husband and I were like, ooh, is this the time? This okay. is the time, right. So for those of us um, and who may be in a position where, you know, we've not necessarily been adverse um, 
and um, adversely impacted and are still, you know, lucky, lucky to have our jobs, refinance is always a great option because, of course, their um, rates are lower and the opportunity to do so is going to present itself. So if you are looking to refi, ding, 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 it's your moment. Right. Are there, are there are different credit eligibility requirements right now yes. for that? Yes, um, particularly for refinancing. Yeah, particularly for refinancing. I can only speak in my experience, and I don't want to speak on behalf of any of the banks because it's been a while um, since I okay. worked at a bank. But typically, the guidelines are pretty um, are pretty fixed when it comes to refinancing. The credit mm -hmm. guidelines are a little stricter because you, when you refinance, you don't have government backed loans like FHA. Um, and you don't have as much access to those options, but you're, a lot of times your bank will have just a, a layered credit um, versus rate and you just check with them and the credit um, restrictions are a little bit more stringent and they're gonna look at your property value, okay? You gotta be, I don't wanna get too technical on this, but you have to have some equity in your home. Depends on the bank, it could be 5%, it could be 20%. Right. Yeah. But you wanna make those calls. So as we are about to, um, I want as as we're about to move into the contact information for each of these um, organizations, I'd like to give each one of our guests um, just a second or so to share with you what they want you to keep in mind as you are going through this time. Um, we're all all of us on this on this uh, call tonight. will say to you be patient and don't give up hope. There are ways for you to get through this and still keep yourself intact financially, but there are things that you have to do. And these women have talked to you about those things this evening. So we're gonna start with you, Shalanda. What would you have people remember from your conversation tonight? So, oh, am I in? Is she on me? No, okay. <laughs> I mean, there you are. Okay. To call a financial coach um, would be the biggest thing because while we're going through this, your coach can help you access resources and help provide opportunities to get you through this. They can work with you with resume writing, um, your budgeting, helping you contact those creditors to make those arrangements you need to make to get through this. Um, and then on the other side of it, if you weren't affected and home ownership is your thing, um, we also have a home buying class that will give you a certification that will let you tap into down payment assistance that might be available through the city of Toledo. Um, it is a rough time right now, but we can all get through this together. Take advantage of these resources, contact any of us for additional information. We are all here to help you. There is no judgment at all. We're just here to assist you living your best life. I love that. There is no judgment at all. No judgment at all. So please don't allow your pride to keep you from contacting Shalanda and her team. Um, you will be so, so very happy you did. Tanya, are you there? It sometimes takes us a moment to unmute our, there she is. I'm here, sorry. No uh, worries. I, I echo a lot of what Shalanda said, you know, we're a village here and we're all in this together and there's no one agency that can be the solvent to what our community is facing right now. Uh, we are all linking arm in arm and we want to get you from A to Z. And so, you know, these services have always been here for you. And these are services that is looking to, you know, equip you and make you successful and to help to um, provide the opportunities for you and your families to thrive and to, you know, get our economy back into a good working condition. So uh, again, there's no, those, there's no shame here. Um, some of us have all been in the, in the same shoes that you're in right now. And Absolutely. Absolutely have the empathy to know uh, what it takes. And, you know, these are very passionate people that are, that's amongst this panel and the people that work in our agencies. Um, and we're here to help and we're gonna get through this together. Thank you so very much. Aisha's back with us. Aisha, what would you have people remember about your comments this evening? Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry about that. I feel like I got cut off in the middle, but um, I did wanna get quickly back to that answer. If you sure. should try to work it out with your landlord, get into a repayment agreement. If you can't and they do file for an eviction, please call us for help. If you have questions about your legal rights, 
please call Legal Aid Line. We have that up. Um, or if you're worried about not making rent and you know, facing a potential eviction, please call us for help. Right. And I think too, it's important to say, and I should have mentioned this earlier, it's important to say that this is also a time to advocate for different policy around these kinds of issues. There is absolutely an inequity in this system that cannot be overlooked, should not be overlooked, but will be overlooked if people don't raise their voices and say, look, this has got to stop now. This has got to stop now. So thank you so very much for your comments. And finally, Kathy, what would you have folks remember about your comments this evening? Well, um, first I'd like to say, you know, um, especially in our African-American community, we've not had access to the information needed to become homeowners. So don't be afraid of it. It's just something different. It's not something that's not obtainable. Um, this is a wonderful time to absorb the knowledge that will be given to get through the home buying process. Um, at our agency, um, it doesn't matter what your credit score is. It does not matter whether you're employed, whether you're not employed. Some people's home buyer process um, with us is, you know, five months. Some people's is five years. So what we will do is take you from beginning to end. And we've helped people improve their scores tremendously and have helped them obtain home ownership. We are um, so excited because we are actually having a virtual home buyer class in May. So from the comfort of your living room and pets allowed, children allowed, just put your <laughs> microphone on mute. My kids might pop up in the back. You never know. Um, but if you are looking to get the process going and we're all at home right now anyway, so what better time to gain that knowledge and really step it up um, in our community? Because to me, um, the biggest thing that's, that um, is in my head is to, um, to change our neighborhoods. We have to own them. Okay. Absolutely. So, um, here's some of our information and you can sign up right on the Facebook page. You can call us or I put my program manager's email up there. Feel free to blow her up. Okay. And I love what you said and say that again, if we say it again about owning our neighborhoods. So um, if we want to, um, if we want to take back our neighborhoods and if we want to, you know, be empowered within our neighborhoods, we have to own them. So absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, ladies, so very much. We're going to show you a series of slides now that has um, information on it as to how to reach each of the participants this evening. Sarah, if you would make those available for us, please. All right, there you are. There is, um, they're only gonna be up for just a second, but please know that each of these slides will be posted on the Lucas County Health Department's website so that you can um, view them at your leisure and get whatever additional information you need. There is also, and we'll hold on just a second, I think there is also a slide coming up about our shop talk session for next week. I'll give you just a second to look at these. There it is, shop talk for next week. Um, COVID-19 and the underlying health conditions. The moderator will be the amazing Charlie Mack. And on that panel, take a look at the pictures of the folks and the names of the folks who will be participating next week. There'll be Dr. Brian, I can't see my screen. Take a look, I'm sure that you all can see those, um, those names at the bottom. They're no longer available to me, but Please, please, please join us next week with, again, Charlie Mack, who will be moderating this very, very important discussion. Thank you all for joining us this evening. You go out, make this a wonderful day. In front of you is um, the series of um, Shop Talk programs to coming up as well, but those will be posted as well. You go out, make this a wonderful evening. We are so happy you joined us. We'll talk to you soon.